Well, Josh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, just an incredible story of the power of the Word of God, uh, just to hear it over the loudspeakers and that it would so grip his heart that he'd put his faith in Christ. And we have such easy access to it, don't we? We have it in our Bibles, and we hear the Word preached every Sunday. Uh, I, I pray that uh, we would have that attitude, that when we hear the Word, that we would know that God, God's Word is living and active. So, we have an opportunity now to uh, share in the Word of God, so I want to invite you to take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, wrapping up uh, our time in this chapter this morning, uh, verses 16 through 26 is where I want to put our focus. And I'll let you turn there. Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. And if you're using the church Bible, you can find that on page 4. Lots of Bibles in the room. Help yourself to one. If you don't own one, you can take it home. Make it your own. Genesis chapter 4. Well, let's give our attention to God's Word as it is read. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after, his, after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Erad, and Erad fathered Mehujael, and Mehujael fathered Methusael, and Methusael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The, the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. This is God's word. I invite you to join me in a prayer as we ask for, for God's help in this time. Our Father, we, we need your help. We have heard this word. We have read this word. But the power of it rests entirely in you and your spirit planting it in, on our hearts and accomplishing in us what we cannot do for ourselves to transform us, to make us wise to salvation in Jesus, to conform us to the very image of your Son. Father, we want that. We know it's your will now. And so we pray that you would give us um, attentiveness, give us readiness to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that what we hear, all of us, is more than the words of a mere man. My words have no power, but your word has all the power. And so, Father, we pray, speak to us. Speak to us now. We need the food of your word to sustain us. And we pray that as a result, the Lord Jesus himself would be glorified. And it's in his name we pray it. Amen. I don't know if you think about your own name, what's in a name, um, most of us have probably, if not told by our parents, looked up the meanings of our names. We've probably done that. And, and perhaps as you've uh, gone about naming your children and thought about what names, um, you probably looked up the meaning of those names too. Uh, they, they matter to some. Uh, they matter not much to others. Uh, I would admit that uh, we named our children uh, because we like the sound of the names, not as much because of what they meant. I guess we're Maybe more shallow than others. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know what my parents were thinking when they named me. 
Um, I, I like to joke uh, sometimes that uh, if, if someone was to choose to put me in my place and say to me, what do you think you are, God's gift to mankind? I could, I could say based on my name, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. Uh, my name, Jonathan, means Yahweh has given. Now, I wouldn't say that, but uh, the, the thought has occurred to in my mind. It would be a very arrogant thing to say, I realize that. Um, we gave Jonathan as a middle name to my oldest, and my daughter has named our, our grandson, Avery, with the middle name Jonathan. So it's, it's, it matters to us. Uh, names matter. Well, in, in, in the Bible, names have huge significance. We just read a lot of names in this passage that we read together. And in a sense, a name anticipates, if you will, a, a legacy. And legacy matters. Now, as I said, a lot of names that we read in this Bible passage, but I want to focus on, on two in particular as a way to think about legacy this morning. And the two names I want to give focus to are Enoch and Enosh. They're very similar sounding, but they have significantly different legacies attached to those names. Now let me recap where we have come from. After the creation story, we're introduced to, to the man and the woman, given the names Adam and Eve, and presented with a beautiful garden, a lush garden where they could enjoy God's presence and eat of any of the trees of the garden. They, they chose to eat of the one tree that God forbade. They ate of the tree, plunging humanity into sin. But part of the curse on the serpent that tempted Eve was this, this nugget of a promise, the promise of of a seed, an offspring that would, that would right the things that Adam and Eve had destroyed, that would, that would uh, finally and fully uh, vanquish the serpent that had so corrupted their minds, the one to whom they gave in and uh, ultimately corrupted humanity. That little seed of hope was, was given. Well then, Eve conceived in the beginning of chapter 4 and gave birth to Cain, declaring, I have gotten a man. And perhaps there was some arrogance in that. She had another son, Abel. Perhaps in her mind, he was the offspring. He was righteous. He brought a righteous offering before the Lord. And, and Cain brought an unrighteous offering, uh, an offering that was not in faith. Um, he didn't trust God, Cain. And he took a path of rebellion and obstinacy. And he ultimately murdered his brother. Now to our text. Contrasted with Cain, at the end of the chapter that we read, we're introduced to Seth, another offspring of Adam. And he leaves a different kind of legacy. Both Cain and Seth have sons. Both of those sons are leaving a legacy, if you will. And the, the kind of legacy that they leave is illustrated Specifically, I believe, in the naming of their respective sons. So, Cain's son, his legacy was Enoch. Seth's son, his legacy was Enosh. And we're going to unpack both of those. Admittedly, we're going to give much more time to, to uh, Cain's son. First of all, Enoch, the legacy of Cain in the naming of his son, Enoch. And I take from the naming of Enoch... There's an idea of self-sufficiency. Enoch represents self-sufficiency. Now, as I already mentioned, and as we've read through the, the passages in weeks past, Cain rebelled against the Lord. He, he rejected the Lord's warning. Uh, God told him, look, sin's crouching at the door. It wants to own you. It wants to control you, but you must rule over it. Well, that sin that was ready to pounce on Cain he let it pounce. He didn't rule over it, and he committed murder. Verse 16, we're told, Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. He went away from the presence of the Lord. There's the Lord. I'm going somewhere else. You can see the darkness in his heart already. So what's happening with Cain? Now, as I, as I looked at this passage, I had a lot of questions about the value of, of what happened in Cain's line, his legacy, if you will. All of the, the earth has benefited in some sense from Cain's legacy. We live in a city. We need agriculture. We, we enjoy music and the arts. 
And our, our society is built on the very tools formed from uh, metals and other resources mined from the earth. One commentator wrote this about Cain. I was trying to understand, and maybe I, I thought, well, get some help from, from this wise commentator. So listen to this. Domiciled in Nod, whither impelled by woman's love, his wife had accompanied him, the unhappy fugitive began to seek if not find, relief from the gnawing agonies of remorse in the endearments of conjugal felicity and the occupations of secular industry. Well, that's one way to look at it. Uh, not very helpful. Not very helpful. But there's something in the way that, that Cain did things. And, and you know, perhaps it, it used to be said that, that rock and roll was the, the, the music of rebellion, and we just sort of take it for granted. So maybe, maybe Cain built this city on rock and roll. That's for you, Paul. <laughs> um, but the, the, the idea in there of building away from the Lord, building away from the Lord, carrying on his life away from the Lord. So Cain's in Nod, and Nod is simply the place of wandering. It was a consequence for his sin. And the direction is important too. It's in the east. That's significant biblically speaking. And if you look at a map, Babylon, its position, is to the east of Jerusalem, where the kingdom of Judah was ultimately exiled. Why? Because of their own sin and rebellion and idolatry. They were sent exiled to the east. So we can take it that the east is really the direction of exile, the direction of wandering. And we also must acknowledge it was certainly an act of mercy from God on Cain that he didn't immediately wipe him out. He didn't immediately strike him dead. But it would seem here that Cain is committed to making a life for himself and his own glory, not a life unto the Lord. And you really get this in a hint of this in verse 17. Look at the text with me. Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. Now, of course, it's not surprising that Cain found a wife, presumably one of the many daughters of, of Adam, not identified in the scriptures. It's not surprising that they had a son, but what is telling is what he was named. Enoch means dedicated. I suppose you could think of that in a, pop, in, in a, in a positive sense, but I ask the question, dedicated to what? What was he dedicated? Well, of course, as he named the city after his son, I take it that, that what Cain is doing is effectively building something through his line that is ultimately to his own glory. So Enoch to Cain represents his own achievements apart from the Lord, far away from the Lord, in the land of Nod. I'm destined to wander? I'll show you what I can do. I got a city. I got a son. I'm going to build this. When he built the city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son. So I, th I take it that it represents his independence from the Lord. Now, Cain's wandering in Nod is certainly a physical reality, but it points to a deeper spiritual reality of what's going on in Cain. His heart, his heart had wandered from the Lord. And if there was even a hint of repentance when he lamented that his iniquity was, was too much to bear when the Lord confronted him for his sin. Now he has turned again to rebellion and he's living independently of the Lord. Now, I want you to keep in mind here as we, we read through Genesis, part of the larger story of the Pentateuch, the Israelites are hearing this story and what they're meant to do is they're meant to see themselves as a nation in Cain the potential for them being just like him. Cain is an archetype for, for the nation of Israel in rebellion. And he's an archetype for our rebellion against the Lord too. Just think of this. In the story of the Bible, even, even through the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, how many times, Exodus mostly, how many times did the Israelites rebel against the Lord after he had rescued them from Egypt? I, I didn't count them all up, but it's a story of constant, the Lord provides, they rebel, they grumble, the Lord provides, they, they repent, and, and the Lord provides again. There's this constant cycle, and it continues through their history. Right now in my Bible reading, I'm in, in the book of Judges, 
And, and you can see that story repeated. The Israelites turn away from the Lord. God sends another nation to torment them, to discipline them. They cry out to the Lord. They repent. But after a while, they, they turn away from the Lord again. The cycle is repeated. So here, here in Nod, in this place of wandering, it seems that Cain has now committed himself to going it alone. And what Cain builds is a civilization, if you can call it that, a civilization. Really, but in, in at least Cain's purposes, it would seem a place not where God is honored, but where man is. And what's that civilization like? Well, we, we see it has the things that every civilization has ever had and needed. There's an institution for progeny, marriage, and procreation. That's there. There's agriculture. Of course you need that, a means of sustaining life. There are the arts, music, right? Something to enjoy beauty. There is industry. There is finding efficient ways to develop tools to sustain life. And ultimately, there is as well, and it might be a little bit oblique here, but there's a system of law to deal with crime. Now, all of these things, we think about it, the institution of marriage, the agriculture, arts, industry, law, all of these are gifts from God, are they not? They are intended for human flourishing. Recall what God said to Adam back in chapter 1, verse 28. God told him, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish and of the sea and of the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Subdue the earth. So be agricultural. Subdue the earth. Mine the metals. Make tools. You see, obeying this command before the face of God what happens, the man then enjoys God's good gifts in his presence and then brings him glory. That's what, that's what the Lord meant for Adam and Eve in the, in the garden in Eden. Look, I've provided all of this for you. Enjoy. And as they enjoyed all of the delightful offerings of that garden, they brought glory to their creator and they lived in fellowship with him. Until, until, they took of the fruit. Cain, following in that tradition, I don't care what you say, God. I'm going it alone. See, when man takes what God has given for human flourishing, all of the good gifts, and then disregards his creator, what he does is he sets himself up as the object of his own worship. This corrupts the good things that God has given. And as we, as we look through his, his, um, his legacy, we, we see this corruption. It shows up first in marriage. Verse 19, And Lamech took two wives. Yes. Okay, so read through our Bibles, we see, okay, more than one wife. That seems that the Lord had permitted polygamy. More than one wife. I, Abraham, Jacob, David, Solomon, and we could go on and on and on. But it was not God's design for the family. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, singular, and they shall become one flesh. So the two... One man, one woman, not three or more. The two shall become one flesh, not fleshes. What, what happens in Nod, of course, we can see, doesn't stay in Nod. It corrupts everything else. Now, understand this. Like, like every other act of human evil and rebellion against the Lord, God providentially even enfolds that somehow into his grand plan. As, as Joseph so eloquently explained at the end of this book of Genesis to his brothers who did evil against him. He says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many sh people should be kept alive as they are today. See, Joseph's brothers acted evilly towards Joseph but God enfolded it 
And I would say in the same way, Lamech's sin of taking more than one wife was somehow accommodated by God, not to excuse the sin. He enfolded it into his grand purposes. But that does not, however, excuse the sin. And ultimately, Lamech corrupted the institution of marriage. Now further, as we look at, at Lamech's wives, it seems to suggest that his regard for them is not as Adam declared about Eve when, when the Lord presented to him his wife. He said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Now the naming of, of Lamech's wives, the meaning of Ada is ornament. The meaning of Zillah is shade. And again, the purpose and meaning of names, they're significant. This is a little challenging to draw any sort of definitive conclusion. Uh, Jewish rabbinic tradition has, has found in the Midrash, which is their collection of writings around the teaching, suggests that Lamech's wives were merely useful to him. One of them as a procreator and the other one for his own pleasure. And there are all kinds of fanciful stories about uh, in the Midrash, dealing with Lamech and the murder of Cain and Tubal Cain. None of that has any scripture warrant, but I think it would suffice to say here that Lamech, regardless of his wives' name, uh, the meaning of his wives' names and how they fit, I, I, I think Lamech, it's pretty clear, had corrupted the good institution of marriage as given by God. Well, next, we see that uh, there are three sons born to Lamech's wives, verses 20 and 22. And what this does is gives us the beginnings of, of expertise in the world. Expertise in animal husbandry, breeding and herds and flocks. So that son is Jabal. He's the one who kind of started that whole thing. Then there's another son, uh, a one who's skilled in, in the lyre and the pipe, stringed instruments, if you will, and then flutes and horns. And his name is Jubal. And then there's another son who's skilled in forging metal, iron and bronze for developing tools and weapons of war. But tools, I might add, that Noah took advantage of when the Lord commanded him to build an ark. So this is the stuff of, of an organized civilization. And I think we can agree it's not necessarily evil. But when you build something away from God, when you build away from his wisdom and blessing, it leads to further corruption. And we can see this in what um, Bible commentators call the song of the sword. It's that poetic uh, uh, section where Lamech uh, says to his wives. What this reveals is both crime and unequal justice. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. So I take it that, that Lamech is proud of his autonomy. A man has wounded him, and that's certainly a crime. But what does he do in response? He kills him. And it's, it's as if he's putting himself in the place of God. He's declaring something that goes way beyond the justice that God decreed to protect Cain, his great-great-great-grandfather, to protect Cain from revenge. So if you'll recall, the Lord declares when Cain complains or laments, my, my, my iniquity or my punishment is too much to bear. They'll kill me if they find me. The Lord said, not so, not so. The Lord determines to protect Cain and, and that the vengeance upon one who would take vengeance against Cain would be seven times. Lamech takes it and multiplies it and says, no, I'm, I'm doubling down, I'm tripling down, I'm multiplying it by ten. That's what I'm going to do to anybody who tries to kill me. See, he has no sense of equal justice. You see, the Israelites were taught to understand how dangerous personal vengeance would be, how it would ultimately distor distort the, the cause of justice. So, so the law as given by the Lord provided specific boundaries, and that's that concept, perhaps you've heard of it, lex talionis. It's really where the, the punishment for a crime should resemble the offense. 
in both the degree but also in the like. So, so it's listed in uh, Leviticus 24. Whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death, life for life. Whoever takes an animal's life shall make it good, life for life. If anyone injures his neighbor, as he has done, it shall be done to him. Injure for injury, fracture for fracture, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person, it shall be given to him. You see that there's that balance. Lamech doesn't have any regard for that. You injured me, you're dead. Because this is a civilization that is away from God. It is independent of God. Not that God didn't see what was going on. God is sovereign over all of those things. But, but, but the way that Cain built it through his legacy, Enoch, he demonstrates good things, right? The legacy of Cain de- demonstrates the, the development of agriculture, of arts and industry. But all the while, because it's away from God, even as the family institution and the concept of justice crumbles. Now, I said all of that, and I think we can see some application for today, at least an understanding or lens to see our society today. Is that not also true of us? We have these amazing advances in agriculture, don't we? We can produce more per square acre than in any time in history. We breed cattle and hogs and sheep, gaining maximum output from minimal resources and artistic expression. Well, that just abounds everywhere, right? With all of our leisure, time for concerts and plays and movies as an entire industry just given to artistic expression. Since the time of Lamech and his sons extracting resources from the ground, that's exploded, of course, using iron, aluminum, silver, gold, platinum, uranium. All of this to create tools for agriculture, for computing, for for automation, right? And most potentially destructive weapons ever. But with all this technology, living as our society does, ignoring the God who gave these gifts, human societies have used all of these things for our own aggrandizing, have we not? It's a pathetic pride. And I was, thought, I was brought to this, this vision, uh, this memory of a, a scene in a movie that, that Chuck Noland in the movie Castaway, you know the scene, he's stranded alone on that, that remote island. After countless attempts, he finally builds a fire, dancing around it. Look what I have created. I have created fire. No, you didn't. <laughs> Our society embraces that kind of attitude, that pride multiplied a thousand million times. And I've thought about this and have longed for this I, it, during this pandemic. How, how refreshing it would have been for, for someone in political leadership to humbly say in front of us that while we work hard to alleviate suffering, we must ask God for the grace and wisdom to take the best path forward and beg, beg for his mercy to save us from death. I've heard none of that. You see, when man believes that he has created, when man believes that his own ingenuity is the primary source of human advancement, when he thinks that, then he has no particular concern to respect the institutions that God had created from the beginning. So cities are not evil. Agriculture is not evil. The arts are not evil. The system of law is not evil. But when these things are for the glory of man and not rightly recognized as gifts from the Lord, it leads to destruction. The Apostle Paul so so, uh, clearly gives us the trajectory of this kind of thinking. Romans 1. And since they, referring to humankind, did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. It's a A list of horrors, isn't it? And we have seen this unfolding before our eyes. 
So, like I said, when, when man thinks that he is responsible, we have all of this because of our clever ingenuity, then he takes the institutions that God has given, things that should be fixed and immovable, and he begins to play with those too. About marriage, society says marriage is what we make it. Now, Lamech took two wives, and it's still surprising to me that that's not legally sanctioned yet. But we know this. Nothing else is off limits, is it? Nothing. Almost nothing. Our society mocks the idea of one man and one woman for life. Why not two women? Why not two men? Men become women. Or, or the idea of one man and one woman for life. What? What's that? And justice? That's become so corrupt, has it not? Certain crimes are deemed acceptable or excusable if you should fall into a proved category called oppressed. And this is just an observation. And I'm not trying to minimize murder in any way. Some murders are called hate crimes. But isn't every murder a hate crime? Some murders are treated with less severe punishments. And just think of the powerful and the politically well-connected. Their crimes are often excused while the poor and marginalized are, are treated more harshly. This is what happens when we think we're the masters of our own destiny. And all this has happened because we think as a society that we are self-sufficient. We live in the legacy of Cain's son, Enoch. That's the world around us. Now we need some good news here, don't we? <laughs> Let's look at the contrast. Verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. And so the second name, we have Enoch, the legacy of Cain, Enosh, the legacy of Seth. And I take it, whereas the legacy of Cain was self-sufficiency, the legacy of Enosh, dependence on the Lord. Now I take it that, that Eve was arrogant when she gave birth to Cain. I have gotten a man, back at the beginning of the chapter, 4 verse 1, but now, in contrast, she conceives and gives birth to Seth. And the contrast in, in, in her attitude is also this, this hopefulness, right? And I mentioned the curse given in Je Genesis 3.15. Since the curse on the serpent, part of that, right, was, was that Eve had been looking for this offspring, the promised one who would, who would ultimately crush the head of the serpent. It wasn't Abel. He was killed by Cain. And it certainly wasn't Cain. He was more like the serpent. But now with Seth, she declares, God has appointed for me another offspring. Offspring instead of Abel. And then we're told that Seth has a son and names him Enosh. Now again, Cain's son Enoch means dedicated. And I take it that that anticipates the legacy of self-sufficiency. Seth names his son Enosh, which means weakness. That's not very flattering. I guess if we were going to name our children, we wouldn't pick a name that says weakness. But, but if you understand your own weakness, think about this. What does that do? It makes you dependent on someone else. And that someone else we discover in the very legacy of Seth through Enosh is, verse 26, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. What a stark contrast. It's a stark contrast to the line of Enoch. Cain settled away from the Lord. The legacy of Seth, on the other hand, Enosh, they began to call on the name of the Lord. So what's the name of the Lord? What does that phrase mean? Well, of course, in that phrase, there's the, div the divine name. So in your Bible, you'll see LORD in all caps, and really what that refers to is Yahweh. 
The way that God revealed himself to his people, the covenant name, the name meaning I am. And in Hebrew, you could look at it, it's almost like a a, a form of the verb to be. I am the existent one. As God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you, the being one, the one from whom all being comes. I am. Now, considering the whole phrase, people began to call on the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord. So in the same way that Enoch and Enosh represent something of the intention and direction of their lives in their names, it's true as well of the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord encompasses the purposes, the, the character, the eternal perfections and beauty of the Lord and all of his plans for his own people. That's the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is his reputation. So think of this. The legacy of Seth in Enosh was that they would be seeking the purposes, the plans, and honoring the will of the Lord. Now, chapter 5 is going to give us a more detailed look into this legacy, and Bob will be actually sharing on that entire passage in a couple weeks. But for now, let's just simply understand what it means to call on the name of the Lord. Now, Enosh was not promised the offspring. His legacy, however, did foreshadow the revelation of him. So Enosh himself wasn't the offspring himself. In Eve's mind, she's hopeful of Seth and that legacy. That's not the offspring. But from Seth to Enosh, through Noah, then Shem, then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, then Judah, then David, King David, finally to the son of Mary, wife of Joseph of the tribe of Judah and in the line of King David, conceived in her by the Holy Spirit and given the name Jesus, there he is. There he is. To call upon the name of the Lord is to look to the offspring of Eve finally and fully revealed in Jesus. So listen to me. What the scriptures is telling us is that whatever your lineage, whatever your parentage, you can call upon the name of the Lord. You can be rescued from your wandering in exile. This is what the apostle Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. He said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone. So, what's your legacy? Cain's legacy is where we live physically. Cain's legacy is where we live physically. This is east of Eden. This is the spiritual Babylon. This is the exile away from from the presence of the Lord. And while we live here physically, we do not have to be spiritual participants. We don't. One day, this civilization, erected to the glory of man, will be no more. All of its industry, all of its culture, all of its agriculture, all of its accomplishments will be destroyed. We get a picture of this in Revelation 18, 20 to 24. So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And just think, think of of what happened in Cain's legacy, right? And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth and all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. Cain. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all who've been slain 
on earth. We live physically in Babylon. But spiritually, if you've called out to Jesus, the promised seed, offspring of the woman, you don't have to live spiritually in the land of Nod. But I get this, fellow believers. Because we live in this physical land of Nod, we can so easily, even though we belong to Christ, we can so easily be duped into treasuring the legacy of Enoch, can't we? We can so easily be duped into ideas of self-sufficiency, self-promotion, self-actualization. When you pray for your children, what's at the top of your list? Oh Lord, give them that great job. I pray that it'll grow up to be president. Um, I don't know if anybody does that anymore. Or when you pray for your children, Lord, open their hearts to know you. Do you treasure to them success, achievement, amassing stuff? Is, is your goal to leave to your children money? Or is it to leave a heritage of faith? And listen to me, high school, college students, what's the trajectory of your life? What will be your legacy? What's the purpose of your education? When you think about the particular career path you've chosen, is it to prove you can make something of yourself? Is it to have the good life? Let me encourage you to examine yourself. Are you living for your own glory like Cain and his legacy, Enoch? Oh, may we all, while we live and wait for the return of Jesus to obliterate Babylon and bring us to his eternal home, while we live physically in Nod, in Babylon, oh, may we have the heart of those who followed after Enosh, weak, looking to God, utterly dependent upon him, for without his grace, without his provision of, of the promised seed, we'd be fooling ourselves, thinking somehow we can make this a better place. We can do well, God. We can offer something of ourselves. We, we can build this. We can't. Like Enosh, we need to know that we are weak that we must call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And while we live in this confusing time where we participate in the world around us, it isn't our primary goal, is it? We, we're part of a better country. We're looking forward to the return of Jesus King. We're not going to prove our lives with a better elected Official, We're not going to improve our lives by getting laws. Oh, oh maybe we'll, we'll put band-aids on things for a while, but that's not our ultimate hope. The legacy of Cain will be destroyed. And all that will be left will be what Jesus brings when he comes in the full glory of his kingdom and every knee will bow before him and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And all, and for all who have waited for his appearing, that will be a day of joy. Oh, I pray that you're waiting for that day. Don't be like Cain. Don't be like Enoch. Be like Enosh. And call upon the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are small and powerless. We know that. There's no hope for us apart from your son. And we thank you, Father, that you sent him. That that seed promise, that offspring promise to Eve so, so very long ago was finally revealed in Jesus of Nazareth, son of David, son of God, divine, sinless, 
crucified on a cross for our sins and raised again on the third day. Father, we look to him, not only for the day of of understanding our need for a Savior, but for every single day. Father, keep our hope fixed on him. And may each of our lives be a legacy of calling on the name of the Lord through Jesus our Savior. And we pray in his name.